Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. If you've 
been forgiven Oh, and if you've been redeemed Sing the song forever to the Lamb And if you're walking freedom And if you bear His name Sing the song forever to the Lamb Oh, we'll sing the song forever and amen And the angels cry Holy, all created
depths of my shame and regret. But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. You sing it. I am. Come on. So I shake off these heavy chains. Everything you got, sing it if you believe it. I am redeemed. You said. today, church. This is resurrection celebrate the celebration today. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, our redemption that we just sang about. Amen. I'll take a moment and find your communion elements in the seat back in front of you or down by your legs. We do this weekly. We, we thank Jesus for the cross. We focus on it. We reflect on it. And this is the day we celebrate it more than any other time in the year. Doesn't mean that he didn't die and raise from the dead for you any other day of the year. That is always true. But today, this communion feels a little bit more special. And if you're a believer, the communion is always, it's, it's vital, it's important. But in this moment, on Resurrection Sunday, I just want to step away from the mic here for a minute. Think about, you think about what Jesus did for you. What, what are we here for? Because he died on your behalf. He took your blame, my blame, our sin, and he rose again. Amen. Right where you're at, just talk to the Lord. Say thank you to the God who wiped away all your sin. Hopefully, we're saying thank you by offering our lives back to Him, by living in a way that would honor Him, in a way that would show this world that we love them like He loves them. Living without anger and bitterness, selfishness, and all these things. Scripture tells us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. It says that that is our spiritual act of worship. I hope that that leads with you today. Think on that. Think of what it means to be a living sacrifice, to live selflessly. The Bible tells us this bread represents his body that took our beating. Everything that we deserve, he took it freely. Give him thanks as we take it together. Cup 
represents the blood he spilled for each and every one of us. Let's give him thanks as we take it together. Let's continue to worship for his holy church. church good good to see everybody today if you're joining us for the first time or visiting the past couple times we say welcome thank you so much for coming and being a part of today's resurrection sunday celebration service whatever it may be but it's a great time as a christian and we're going to talk a lot about the reason why the resurrection but before i get started i just need to get these couple quick announcements the bible study is to resume uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m. in the lower level. The Bible study on Wednesday at 7 p.m. after the resurrection is resuming this Wednesday. Prayer and praise is this Thursday right here at 7. And then next Sunday, we have the bikers coming. Biker Sunday. And uh, it's when, if you haven't been here, we bring the motorcycles all up inside here. And there's quite a few of them that come here. So that's always a great event as well. So, so, um, so that's, that's the announcements for this week. Amen. All right, so let me get started right into the, to the uh, sermon here. And um, it's, as I said, it's Resurrection Sunday. And today, you know, a lot of times we may call it Easter Sunday. Uh, but I just want to bring some clarity to really what this day is all about. And it's really about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for us, and then he rose again. And as I go through this, I'm going to say, this message is maybe more of a teaching type of thing. And the reason why I say that is because please tell your children the truth about Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, it's great. We know we, we sometimes we can get sidetracked on really what the meaning is. Sometimes we get, you know, uh, camouflaged, if you will. I think of Christmas. Christmas is a great season, the birth of Jesus. But sometimes Santa Claus overtakes uh, the birth of Jesus. 
uh, the resurrection. You know, sometimes the Easter bunny <laughs> takes over. You know, it's okay to have the treats, and it's really a celebration. But as we go through here, you're going to learn a lot, I believe. And I'm going to say this again. Please tell the children. Please tell your grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Tell people the true meaning of it. So we get into this word, resurrection. What does this word really mean? Well, it means to raise up, to stand. It's used to raise up from the dead. I think most of us know that. Jesus rose from the dead. Now, you can say, well, many people have rose from the dead. Yeah, but then they eventually die. But Jesus rose from the dead, and he's alive this very day. Now, it's obvious here what we're celebrating. We're celebrating, to me, the greatest day of, the, of our life. The greatest day. Just think, the greatest day in society. And you're going to see why as well. But really, before I expose it all, I'm just going to say this. The resurrection is what sealed the deal. It just sealed the deal. Now, I'm going to explain this as we go. But before we get into the reason for this celebration, let's talk how we got to this point. How do we get to this point in society, in the world, to, ser- to celebrate a day that we call Resurrection Sunday? How do we get to it? You know, it's so important that we really understand it because much is said about this event and many people don't really understand what it's all about. Many people don't understand the importance of the resurrection. And we talk about that, but let me tell you something else. The cross is important. And if we, if we don't understand the cross, we for sure ain't going to understand the resurrection. So again, as we kind of go through this, Take it as a learning session, if you will, so you'll be able to have a full understanding of what Resurrection Sunday is, what Easter Sunday is, if you call it Easter Sunday, what it may be, so you know the truth behind this great holy day. So Jesus talked about this. He talked about his death on the cross before he died. We see here in Luke 18, verse 31, 32, and 33, Jesus says this, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished. Okay, so he's telling his disciples here, look, it's not happening yet, but it's going to happen. What you've read in the Old Testament writings is going to take place. Verse 32 for he will, be delivered, he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. I think so much of what we know about the cross, about the death of Jesus, may, maybe just kind of, um, we don't know the whole story. Maybe we're missing some really, really important parts of what happened on the cross. Verse 33. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Jesus talking about himself. So you see here that something has taken place. He's already saying, I'm going to get beaten up. I'm going to get worked over. And most people know that with the the whips and, and all that kind of stuff. We understand that. But he's saying on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Now, there's over 300 prophecies in the Bible talking about Jesus. Now, we're talking hundreds of years ago. We know he arrived as a little baby in a manger, but there's so much more about this life of God. Remember, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we talk about this word prophecy. What is prophecy? Well, prophecy is this. It's the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth. It's something that someone, God has downloaded something, and they're saying, this is what's going to happen, and it happens. It's not like the word prediction. You know what I mean? Sometimes we can predict certain things. We can estimate something. We can estimate by some facts that we have to say, this is what's going to happen you know, next year. This is what's going to happen next week, or this is what's going to happen tomorrow, because certain things may be giving you indicators to predict something, but it doesn't mean it's going to, be, it's going to happen. Prophecy is God telling it's going to happen. And not only that, now we have the 
we have the beautiful opportunity through the word of God to see prophecy that takes place. Now, let's go a little further because I want to get into a prophecy some 700 plus years before the cross even happened. Just think about this. But it's given us more of a detail of what's going to take place at the cross. Okay, so, so we see in Isaiah 50, verse 6, he said, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face for shame and spitting. Look at this, pulled out his beard. Many people don't know that. Many people haven't seen that in the Bible, but Jesus's beard got ripped out of his face. Okay, you got to get this to understand what he did for us. Now, again, we will see on the crosses, we'll see Jesus with the long hair, looking, you know, like, a, you know, it's just a cool guy that got beat up a little bit. But it goes into more detail in the prophecy. Now, we see in Isaiah 52, it says, but many were amazed when they saw him. Listen to this. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. So we see the body of Jesus on the cross. We all grown up with it. We've seen the crucifix and we've seen the passion of the Christ, things like that. We grew up with that. But this is giving you a little bit more um, points, a little bit more description of what really took place on the cross for you and I. And it even says here that he was, he was disfigured. He seemed hardly human. I can't imagine. And I, as I've been working this, I've been trying to process in my own mind what that sight must have been on the cross, what it must have been to look at that. And I'll tell you another thing as well. History tells you that when Romans crucified anybody, they crucified them naked. They humbled the person as much as they could. We see now in, in uh artist renderings or whatever, they always put a robe on them. But that's not what history tells us. And I think in the word of God, you can, you can see that as well. So you can see the importance of the cross. And we can't miss out what the cross is all about. But we got to say, why? Why the cross? That's probably the question. Really, why, why did this have to take place? Well, let's, let's pull out the character of God a little bit. Let's see some more about God, and then we'll understand why we have the cross and why it is what it is. So we see some of the, the nature of God, the char characteristics of God. Revelation verse four, uh, 15, verse 4 says, For you alone are holy. For you alone are holy. We're setting up something here. We're setting up that... God is holy. We see it through scripture. Revelation 4, 8 says, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, who was and is and is to come. So we see again, holy, holy, God is holy. We see there that he always was, and we see that he is right now, and we see that he always will be. Now, I'll say this. Many of us have a hard time comprehending that. We, we have a hard time comprehending, understanding how can this be? How can God always was and always will be? I say this, you just got to get to know God. You, you know, we can't think like God. Our mind doesn't work like God's does, so we can only go so far. But if it says it, I believe it. Now, Psalm 22 says this, but you are holy. You are holy. You are holy, speaking of God. So I think we determine here that God's holy. I think we determine that. I think we all probably knew that as well. We see it in scripture. We grew up with it and we knew that. So that's one great characteristic of God. But here's another characteristic. He's a just God. He's a just God. We see that in scripture as well. Isaiah says it this way. For the Lord is a God of justice. For the Lord is a God of justice. Psalms 89 says this, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. We see that God is righteousness, but we're, we're going back to this justice. He's a just God. We see in Romans 2.11, it says, for there is no partiality with God. 
God doesn't look at someone different because maybe they're holy or they're, you know, they're a, a seasoned saint, whatever. Everybody's on the same playing field. So we see now that God is holy. We see that he's righteous, but now we also see that he's just. I want to kind of make a little um, example of a, a thought here. In the court system, the judge is required to give a just punishment for the crime. Now, I know sometimes they can wiggle back and forth and all that, but they're supposed to give a just punishment for the crime. There's a cost to be paid for an, an offense. Let me give you an example. Somebody robs your house. They catch them. You want justice. Matter of fact, we probably want a little bit more than justice. You know, we want the guy to go to jail and then we want him to pay back what he has taken. But there's a payment for the crime. Somebody scams you. You want justice. We all want justice. That's just the law of the land. So a holy God demands justice as well. He requires justice. He requires a payment from the offender. A holy God. Sin is an offense to God. And there's a price to be paid. There's a price to be paid for sin. There's a price to be paid for disobedience. A holy God requires justice. Sin is an offense to God. And the price is to be paid. Sin is a great offense to God. Many times we try to water down sin. And say we're okay in doing this. God understands me. He'll let me do this. God knows my heart. God's a just God. Yeah, he's a loving God. He's a holy God, but he's a just God. No matter what you think, many people try to conform their life according to God. And God said, it doesn't work that way. You need to be transformed. You get transformed by renewing your mind, by reading the word of God. So sin, again, is a great offense. A matter of fact, its punishment is a life sentence without the parole and without being pardoned. It's forever and ever. That's, that's justice for each and every one of us. I promise you we're going to turn this thing around. And it's going to be a good ending. Okay. But right now, it doesn't sound good because here's the problem. Right now, you are in one of two categories. You have been found guilty or you have been pardoned. And one or the other, we're all, we're all in, on one of these. Found guilty or you've been pardoned. You may say, what are you talking about here? How am I guilty? I'm not a bad person. I haven't done anything wrong. But the Bible says that we're all sinners. What happened here was in the garden, in the Garden of Eden. God, God put Adam and Eve in this perfect garden, a beautiful garden. They didn't have to do anything. God was supplying everything through the garden. They had to tend to it, but they didn't have to earn it. And God said, Adam, one thing I'm telling you, don't eat from this one tree in this garden. It's like God had made it so easy to obey him. So easy. Just this one tree. I think we know the story here. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. And disobedience is sin. Disobedience is sin. So God created this perfect environment, but he also put in a gift to each and every single person. And the gift is our free will. We can choose what we want to do. Most people do choose what they want to do. They choose if they want to grow close to God or they choose they want to stay away from God. They choose all these different things. And it's God's gift that he's given us. It's just like our children. I want my kids to love me because I'm their father. I don't want them to love me because I buy everything for them. You know, we feed them, we house them. My kids are grown now at this point. So now they know how it feels. But... <laughs> But the point is, you want, you, want your, you want your children, you want your spouse to love you like unconditionally. Yeah, we're going to make mistakes. We know that. But you still want them to love you. You don't want to be forced to be, for someone to love you. And that's what God did with Adam and Eve. 
He gave them the free will to receive them or to reject them. One or the other. We all have to make that same type of decision. We're going to choose God or we're not going to choose God. And it's really that's plain, it's that plain and it's that simple. I'm not saying choose religion because I don't like religion. Okay, religion is man's way to God, and religion actually takes you away from God. Now, understand in Scripture, there's some good religion when you're helping people out and things like that. But the point is, as we know religion, as we know, um, uh, I guess, religion of today, it's do's and don'ts and all these different things, and it's really pulling you away from God, if you, ever, if you notice that. So at that point, Adam and Eve... They created that sin. They created that offense. Sin entered into the world because of that. Sin was passed down to every single person. Yeah, you could, be the, you could be the nicest person in the world. You can go to church every day of the week. You can feed the hungry, give to the poor. You can, you can be the nicest person, but you already got sin in you. What do you mean? The verdict for them was guilty, and the sentence was life. But what happened here? What took place in their disobedience, in their sin? They got kicked out of this beautiful garden, and every person was inherited that sin. Doesn't seem fair, but that's the way it is. So life without God, the guilty sentence, without being pardoned, the sentence is prison, a prison called hell, separation from God. Take this serious, folks. I'm not trying to make a joke. I'm not trying to to be, play light with this. There's a destination of heaven and there's a destination of hell. Nothing in between. The Bible doesn't say anything about anything in between. It's one or the other. And decision time happens here. Decision time happens now. We don't know what the next hour is going to bring in our lives. We don't know what the next day is going to bring in our lives. But we know one thing by the word of God, there's, there's life after death. So the prison is hell. But I hope you get the point. This is why the Bible says, and it says it so clearly about Adam's once sin made all people sinners. Romans 3.23, the scripture says this, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We all sin, we're all sinners. The Bible says you're a sinner. The Bible says that sin separates us from God. The Bible says sin will, will keep God from even hearing you. So we come into this world with this sin nature. A sin nature produces sin. It's really that simple when we think about it. Sin nature produces sin. This is why we sin. So we look at scripture. We continue to go back and forth the scriptures. But God so loved us. There was only one way that we could get right with God. Or I should say to appease God. There's only one way. What a great plan that God has given us. It's like, I'm giving you another chance here. Let's make it happen. So what is the plan? It needed holy blood for the sacrifice. If you know the Old Testament, there was a lot of sacrifices that was taking place. Now in the New Testament, where we live in, we live in the New Testament. Now we have, we have a, a, a propitiation for our sin, the scripture says. And here's the way it starts. In Hebrews 9, 11, it says, For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood. Let me say something. It's not your blood. Because your blood wouldn't do it. It's not the shedding of blood of bulls and goats like the Old Testament. Because that wouldn't do it either. It could only be holy blood. It could only be a God thing. God blood. Remember, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus came and sacrificed his blood for us. That appeased God. That was the propitiation, that word to appease, to appease there. But we also continue to see in Scripture, because I really say this. I pray that the Scripture is penetrating your heart. You know, what I'm saying is just fluff in between the Scriptures. But you let the Scriptures Go into your heart, into your soul deeply, and hear what God says. And some of this, you got to ponder. You got to just ponder. And, you know, the Bible says you seek God, you're going to find him. But if you don't seek him, you're not going to find him. So where are we at? Second Corinthians. He, for he made him, 
God made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, we're setting up here. The scripture is saying something. There's a plan here, and Jesus is the plan. He who knew no sin. Jesus didn't know sin. This is why nobody could do anything to appease the, the sinful nature that we have. Only God could do it. First Timothy says this. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. He gave it. So now we get back to the cross a little bit more. A sacrifice that pays the price for those who receive it. And only to those who receive it. I don't care what you grew up. I don't care what denomination, what church, how good your parents were. Now it's about each and every one of us individually. Only those who receive it. It's kind of interesting now, if you kind of remember the, the courtroom setting that we were talking about. Now it's that just judge is saying, okay, it's up to you now. It's up to you. Are you going to choose heaven or are you going to choose hell? You make the sentence. <laughs> you know, this is what God has done. He's, he came, he made the plan, but it doesn't mean the plan is going to happen to you unless you choose it. Okay, you got it? You're tracking me on it? I know there's a lot here, and I hope you haven't fallen asleep yet. And I know we're probably all thinking of dinner and everything else, but just give me a couple more minutes, and we're going to wrap it up here because I'm getting hungry too. <laughs> but anyway, there's a, there's a point here as the just judge, the righteous judge says, okay, now it's up to you. I made the plan. You're going to choose heaven or you're going to choose hell, and it's up to each and every one of us. It's that free will. Choose an abundant life while you're here waiting to go to heaven. You know, Jesus says this. He says, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Yeah, we know we're talking here about our, our, our um, ticket to heaven. I hate to say it that way, but our, our position on getting to heaven. We know how to do that. But also in the promise, God is saying, you have the abundant life for the here and now. Now, let me say something about the abundant life. Doesn't mean you're going to have... Um, an absence of problems because we're going to deal with problems. We're going to have situations. We're going to have people we got to deal with. We're going to have finances. We're going to have health thing. We're going to have all these different things. But God says, look, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to get you through this. No matter what your problem is, no matter what you're going through, you might be in a hospital bed right now. Let me say this. God says he's going to get you through it. God says he's going to be with you as you go through it. Amen. So choose the abundant life. So God, so Jesus, God in flesh, paid our price when he sacrificed his blood for you and for me. You know, when we have this Good Friday, it really is a celebration. Yeah, we can mourn it. We can think it's a sad thing and all that. But man, let me tell you something. If we didn't have the death of Jesus, we would all be going to hell. We'd be all doomed for hell. We'd be a mess right now. This whole world is a mess now. But can you imagine if, if Christ wasn't in this world? So we do celebrate Good Friday. We do celebrate communion, as Pastor Josh said earlier. Communion, we take communion seriously here. We have it every week. Sometimes during the middle of the week, pray, prayer and praise, we have communion. You do this in remembrance of what he done. I'm telling you what he has done for us. If you can grasp this whole, this whole uh, picture of the cross, you begin to realize, okay, something real has happened here. Something real. This is not ordinary that took place. This is why when we take communion, we take it seriously. We don't mess around with it. It's not just a segment in the service. It is a reset us. And as often as you take it, you don't remember it. As often as you take it, you don't have to take it just on Sundays. Take it during the week, but make it get your mind back on the cross, what, he's, what he has done for us. So we celebrate communion. We celebrate Good Friday, remembering what God has done for us. In 1 Corinthians, it says this, For I deliver to you first of all that which I also receive, that Christ died for what? For our sins. For what? According to the scriptures. We see it in the scriptures 
before he even died, before he was even born, we've seen it was already planned in this scripture. God already had a plan here. He wasn't deserting us. He wasn't like saying, oh man, Adam and Eve sinned. Now what are we going to do? I don't know what to do here. You know, no, God had a plan here. And it says here in verse four, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He came back. He's back again. But we see here that this word was saying that he's taken this beat and he's going to get buried and he rose again. This is after now, but he rose according to the scripture. Jesus is alive and he's a well this very day. If you don't know that, you don't have a relationship with him. You don't know that. You don't, you don't know him personally. You have to know him personally to have the relationship. If you don't know him personally right now, God, you don't even want to have nothing to do with God because you don't have that relationship. It's like, I don't know this guy in, on the other side of the country, so I don't, I don't have a relationship with him. But if you have someone real close to you, you have a spouse or a, a family member, you get to know him because it's about that relationship. And that's what God wants. He wants that relationship with you. Like I say, he don't want this religion stuff. He wants a relationship with you because he loves you and he cares for you. So now we get back to the resurrection. This is where we start wrapping up, bringing it to a close, if you will. And we see here that we're celebrating this resurrection. The resurrection is so important. It's critical. It's so important that it's not just a holiday that we, you know, we, we eat. It's a, it's, a, it's a great time. And here's how important it is. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If the resurrection didn't happen, we'd be wasting our time here, folks. I don't know how else to say it. I'm just be blunt with it. You know, we, we would be just wasting our time. Jesus intentionally came to the earth to die for our sins. That was a plan. That was a plan. It was intentional that he came. It was God's plan to bring us salvation, to give us another chance, to give us the opportunity. But also that comes with that opportunity is that free will, that decision that each person has to make. Jesus told about his disciples and this event that was going to follow. John 14 says this, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Think about that for a minute there. Think about that for a second. We see in John, it says, so that when it does take place, when it does happen, you'll believe. It already happened. It already happened. So we can believe. We can believe. There's no better news than this in your life. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what kind of sickness, disease, what kind of, uh, what life has dealt you. There is no, no better news than this, that Christ died for you. He died for you because he loves you. We see here, and I'm, and I'm bringing it to a close. We see here this. In Isaiah 55, 6, it says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him. While he is near. I said this before. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But one thing we do know. God has given every person here. And who's watching online. The opportunity to make that decision. To choose God. You may say I'm not ready for God. I don't want this stuff here. I have nothing to do with God. Well that's up to you. But the verdict is in. You have to believe when you believe God responds to your response to him. There is no acceptance without a commitment. It's not just saying some canned prayer and everything's going to change. It could change. That would be awesome if it changed and it does change many people, but it's not until they give their heart. They choose to give their heart. They choose to want to do this. The free will gift of choice is now in your court. What is your verdict about yourself? John eleven twenty five 25 says this, 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. A lot of times people think death is an end. Death isn't an end. Death is a beginning. It's a beginning. But Jesus says he's the resurrection. Romans 10, 9 says it this way. That if you confess with your mouth, like I'm speaking now, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. See, we believe from the heart, but we also have to confess it out. I want to ask us all to pray here in a minute because you're going to have the opportunity to get right with God. You get right or you're going to get left, one or the other. You don't get anything out of Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection again unless you, from your heart, you believe. John 3, 16 and verse 17 says this, for this is how God loved the world. This is how God loved you. Put your name in there. He gave God's a giver. He's not a taker. He gave his one and only son so that whoever, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Perish means separation from God. Eternal life means life with God for eternity. This is God's promise for you. I think you're here today because you have a, you have a, a you know, a belief system that may have taught you about God, which is good, but we got to take it to the next level. And don't make a mistake here. Verse 17 says this, God's, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Sometimes we think God is a, you know, he's got a whip and a baseball bat. He just wants to clobber us. Ah, there you go. You messed up again. No, that's not what he's all about. Because he's a loving God and he's continuing to give us opportunities. Yeah, he's a holy God. Yeah, he's a loving God. Yeah, he's a, a, a God of justice. Yeah, he's a God of righteousness. The whole the list can go on and on. But this is a God that loves us, that's willing to give something to people that don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But all we have to do is accept it. Amen? I'm gonna, why don't we stand at this point here? I want to close with, as I would say, a joint prayer, a joint prayer. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out there to you. Don't pray this prayer. If you don't, if you don't believe it, don't pray it. But you see the word of God is very clear. We see that there's a heaven, there's a hell. We see that we have to confess with our mouth. And if we don't do that, you know, it's your choice. So when judgment day comes, because it's going to come for every one of us, you're going to stand before the judge and he's going to say, guilty, or he's going to say, come on in, welcome in. So allow me to lead in prayer, and I'm going to ask you to follow out loud, no screaming or anything, just out loud between you and God. God wants us to admit that we're sinners. God wants us to ask him for forgiveness. God wants us to invite him in. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'm coming in. That's, see, again, God's a gentleman. He's not kicking down the door. He's saying, look, I'm just knocking, you know, I'm just knocking at the door. If you open up, I'm coming in. And then I want to, I want to have supper with you. That's the relationship there. He wants to not just have a religion thing of saying a prayer. He wants to, he wants you to invite him into your heart, into your house, and then have that relationship. A lot takes place at the dinner table. A lot of relationship, a lot of communication, a lot of talk happens at the, at the, um, at the dining room table. So join me in prayer. I'm going to lead. We can all pray out loud together. Again, if you don't want to, don't, because I don't want to put any pressure. I don't want to be pressured, but I want to say something. I got a message I had to share, and it came from the Lord. And without a doubt, it's for each and every one of us. So let's pray. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I thank you for dying on the cross and rising from the dead for me. Be my Lord and Savior. 
and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Word of God is very clear. You prayed that prayer, you mean it. The Holy Spirit indwelled in you. He lives in you. Build that relationship up. Build it up. It's up to you to build it up. It's up to you to grow closer to God. It's up to you to get serious about God and stop playing games that, oh, I don't need God. I'm okay without God. No, you made a confession. Now you build. Because again, he's knocking at the door. If you prayed it, you opened the door. Now he wants to come in. He wants to have time with you. Amen. So, Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for, I thank you for each person here today. Lord, I thank you as we celebrate the resurrection, your resurrection. We celebrate death and the resurrection. And Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for the resurrection just to prove that everything that you have said in Scripture and even outside of Scripture, Lord, that your word is true. And this event of the, of the resurrection took place. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, that sealed the deal that everything that we talk about, everything we preach, everything that you have downloaded us is now proven from the resurrection. So God, again, I thank you for this time. I thank you for each person here, each person watching online. I pray anyone needs a touch of, of healing, Lord, they would come up to the prayer team afterwards on my right and left, or Lord, they would just continue to seek you because Lord, we know that you've given us the abundant life. You didn't give us, you didn't shortchange us. You want the best for us. And I thank you for that. So Lord, again, I pray a blessing over each person here. And Lord, as we go out from here and we have our celebration, Lord, let us really remember, let us even share with other people what this day is all about. So Lord, we thank you for so many blessings, but most of all, we thank you for Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead for us. And it's in Jesus' name. Christ is risen from the dead, trembling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death, where is Cheesecake Factory cheesecakes on a table. They are frozen. They're meant to be taken home and enjoyed by the family. We ask that you take one for family and just for the families that are here currently today. Does that sound all right? All right, my best good friends, Neil and Tammy, are back there. They'll help you out. Thanks. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Sunday. <laughs>